Please open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. We'll be looking at verses 35 through 38. Seeing the shepherd's compassion on shepherdless sheep. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. If you're joining us this morning, welcome. Uh, it's, uh, we're joyful to have you here with us this morning, and we'd love to get to know you. And uh, if you've been here for a while, look around, and if you see any unfamiliar faces, be sure to to greet them and love on them. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you as, as your bride, your people, asking, Father, for mercy. Show us grace this morning, Lord. Command your blessing upon us. As we sit before your word, Lord, let it be a sword that pierces our hearts. Let it convict us. Let it show us, Lord, its, its sin, our misery, our blindness, our poverty. And Lord, use your word to show us your Son, Show us His glories, His compassion, what He's done for us. My God, this is a work that I can't do, no one else here can do, only You can do it. So please, Father, please send Your Spirit, fill us with Your Spirit in such a marvelous way this morning that we would pay attention to Your words, that we would heed them that our hearts would be stirred up as we leave here today, that we wouldn't just fill up our mind with more information. Oh God, change our hearts. Renew our minds. Help us, Lord Jesus. We beg you. Be set on display this morning. Help all of us, God. Whatever weaknesses we come in with this morning, help us to sit beneath your word in silence. We love you, Lord, and we ask this in your precious name. Amen. So compassion is an attribute which might be defined by the desire to help the helpless or a strong sense of care towards somebody in need, someone who's unable to care for themselves. And the word for compassion literally means to be moved in the inner parts. And it's such a characteristic which only happens by seeing need. That is, if you're passing by a shipwreck and you see different people in the water, one is flailing his arms and he's struggling to even float and he's being sunk beneath the waves and the other's treading water just fine. It's your compassion that drives you to focus on helping the one that's struggling rather than the one that could have float there a few more hours. And so true compassion doesn't necessarily come when you see somebody doing well, but when you see them hurt, beaten, discouraged, trampled upon, struggling. And it was this very feeling that the father had on the prodigal son as he returned home, naked, wretched, miserable, poor, carrying this stench of just death. And he saw him from afar, and he had compassion on him. And so it is with the Lord as he sees us in our great neediness and weaknesses. He has this great compassion. He is the God that loves the world, having compassion on us by raising the sun each morning after the cold night and sending waters on the, on the fields of plants to, to give us food so that we can live. His compassion is seen all around us in the various provisions he gives for us. And in this passage, we see the very heart of the Lord where he looked upon the crowds and he had compassion upon them because he saw something was majorly wrong. A key component was missing. For these people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And in seeing their many needs, Jesus is stirred up 
with the most wonderful compassion. And this was a compassion that wasn't new when Jesus came on the scene, but was in him before the foundation of the world, before he came. I've heard people say in their ignorance that Jesus came down to earth to learn us, to study us, as if he had no idea who we were. But they've completely missed it. Because Jesus came into this world knowing exactly who we were. He knew fully about us. He knew the many issues of our hearts, all our sin, all our brokenness, all our misery, all our guilt. He saw us and he knew us fully that we were sheep wandering to our own destruction, following our own passions, following the prince of the power of the air as, as children of wrath. And by knowing this and seeing this, it was his compassion that was within him to bring us out of our misery. For when God saw our needs he knew he had the very solution to our needs. And that solution is his son. And so we know that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son so that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Jesus came into the world shining forth that same compassion that was in him before he came. And he never saw us in our need without having compassion. He had unwearied pity. It was the constant theme of his heart because we had unwearied needs. He had compassion toward us with our simple needs. Mark 8, 2, I have compassion on the crowd, Jesus says, because they've been with me these many days and they have nothing to eat. And he has compassion toward us with our eternal needs, even as it's written in our verse. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so this morning, I want us to look at a few aspects of the compassion of Christ being revealed through this passage, beginning with our first point, that Jesus' compassion is seen as he proclaims the gospel and he heals diseases. Read with me verse 35. And when Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction... Everything since the fall of man has been completely out of place and is no longer what it was initially meant to be. In the very pinnacle of God's creation, you and me, men and women, we have fallen away completely from the life of God and we are now to taste death, both of body and of soul. When sin entered into the world, it, it, it corrupted God's intended design with mankind. And so we read from Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, in Ephesians 4.18, that we've been alienated from the life of God. Sin had a venomous sting causing all mankind to die, body and soul. And now Jesus was surrounded by these people that had fallen away from the life of God. He was surrounded by those that were dead in their sin, whose bodies were suffering illnesses and cancers and leprosy and all sorts of diseases and afflictions. Their bodies and their souls were carrying this stench of death. But instead of being repulsed by it, Jesus enters into the midst of it. And so we read in our verse that he even went throughout all the cities and all the villages. He did not try to get away from the stench of sinners, but he intentionally pursued them. He did not take the scenic route, but he took the social route. And it was his compassion that compelled him to do so. His compassion led him to the cities and his compassion led him to teach in their synagogues and to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and heal every disease and every affliction. Or to put it into two categories, his compassion compelled him to, to preach and to be the physician to these people. Oftentimes, one of these aspects of his ministry gets overemphasized at the cost of the other. In more reformed circles, we tend to overemphasize the teaching ministry of Jesus while we neglect that he truly did heal afflictions and diseases and all sorts of things. And in other circles, the healings of Jesus gets emphasized at the cost of his preaching ministry, where that's all the focus is. And even though the preaching ministry is more important because we know that it's by faith we're saved, we can't completely forget that Jesus truly did care for the physical needs of people. We must hold a proper balance between the two because they're both significant. And this is because Jesus is the Savior of both the body and the soul. 
Jesus has not only come to return life to our souls which have died, but also to our bodies which have died. Jesus has not only come to make our souls alive by faith, but also to make our bodies alive in the resurrection when he returns in the final day. So he sees the problem that the soul has, that it's separated from the life of God, an enmity against God, and because of this, he, pre- he preaches the truth. And he also sees the problem that the body has, under a curse, ridden with sicknesses and illnesses, born with diseases and disabilities, and he compassionately heals them. And in doing so, he gives them a taste of the power that will be demonstrated in the last day when he returns to give life and immortality to our bodies. In fact, Jesus always had the final resurrection day in mind as he tells us in John 6, 38 through 40. Jesus says, I've come down from heaven. Why? He says, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. That is the Father's will. And what is the Father's will? Jesus says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father. If you've missed it, this is the will of my Father. Let me speak it more even, even more clearly. That everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I will raise Him up on the last day. This is the very will of the Father that, that Jesus would proclaim so that people might believe in Him. And believing in Him that He would finally raise them up on the last day. And so He came down to do this very thing. He came to give us life and to give it abundantly. He did not come to give us partial life for our bodies only while our souls are left to die, nor did He come to give life for our souls only while our bodies die. Jesus came to give us life to its fullest measure, the very life of God. He came for a holistic redemption, not just a partial one. He gives life for both our body and our soul, and He does this out of His rich and overflowing compassion. As he was preaching and he was healing, a great crowd began to gather. And therefore, we see that, secondly, Jesus' compassion is revealed as he sees our great problems. Read with me in verses 36 to 37. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. As this crowd is set before Jesus, the the grim reality of their perishing souls becomes very clear. Because he sees that they are harassed and helpless and he compares them to being sheep having no shepherd, just wandering about, doing what seems right to them. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus speaks of this shattering truth that there are two paths. One that leads to hell or destruction, and the other one that leads to eternal life. And he speaks of these two paths in this way. Jesus says the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Or in other words, if you missed it, many are on the route toward hell, few on the route toward heaven. And upon seeing the crowds, it's as if he saw just that that broad path, those many sheep, that multitude of people that were heading toward their own destruction, and he had compassion upon them. He desired not that they would perish, but that they would reach repentance that He might become their shepherd and bring them to eternal life, to bring them out of their their path toward eternal misery onto the narrow path unto eternal life. He cared for them. So what was it about these sheep that stirred up such a compassion as this? First, sheep are wandering. Sheep that are wandering without a shepherd, they are harassed. They are harassed. It's pretty evident that mankind is harassed with lies by their own sinful desires, by the devil, by fears of death. Lies often appear attractive, but in the core of them, they are truly destructive. 
And yet we like sheep are so prone to follow after them because the devil is, is very crafty and he knows very well how to make a lie look so good and taste so good until finally it stings. Mankind is harassed by the lies of false religions and false messiahs. I don't have enough time to list how many false religions there are. There's, there's so many. And, then, and they look so good to human wisdom. They, they appeal to what we want as sinners. But they leave us more naked than when we came into this world. Others appear even a little closer to the truth. They look to a certain Savior. But they don't want the Savior that God sends. They want their own. They make their own Jesus. Some want a Jesus that lets them just live in their sin. Others want a Jesus that gives them this world. Even some believe in a Jesus, but they see him nothing more than a moral guy or a historical figure or a prophet or a mere man or somebody that gives me life and prosperity. They're also harassed by their own sinful desires. Jesus saw that they were enslaved to their own passions. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Their lusts were driving them. Their passions controlled them. And they were harassed also by the father of lies, the devil, made captive by him to do his will. Under his harsh slavery, they followed the prince of the power of the air, who was a severe master over them, who had abused them with fears and with anxieties. Jesus saw that they were harassed with Satan's constant desire to do them harm and not good. Like a lion playing around with its prey before he finally snaps his jaws and, and kills it. So Satan was harassing them, torturing them in different ways. And they're harassed by the fears of death, having no idea what, what happens in that day. They, they saw death as a, as, with a thick veil lying over it. What happens? I know there's judgment behind it, but what happens? What is it? A terrifying, terrifying thing. Secondly, these sheep wandering without a shepherd are helpless being unable to save themselves, only to get themselves into trouble. Sheep are good at one thing, and it's wandering. They can't make their, their way from point A to point B. A sheep is good at only finding itself in the jaws of the lion, and they, they wander away, and they're, they're left to just be torn apart by beasts. And when left alone, they're, they're constantly faced with the prowling, prowling lions behind the, the tall grass that's lurking and, and taunting them. And the sheep might find itself in the mouth of the lion, and at that point, it's helpless. It can't do anything. It can't deliver itself. It's stuck. And the only way that sheep might get delivered is if its shepherd, like David, would fling its stone at the, sheep, uh, at, at the, at the beast and kill it so that it would be delivered. And so Jesus saw this crowd as unable to save themselves, unable to do anything for their souls. And seeing them as shepherdless sheep, Harassed and helpless, he had rich and overflowing compassion for them. Because he saw that in all of these things, that if only they had a shepherd, that all their problems would be immediately gone. He knew that he was that very shepherd they needed. In John 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So being then full of compassion, he makes this statement. The harvest is plentiful, he says, but the laborers are few. The harvest clearly represents mankind, that there's a great amount of people in need of salvation. But the laborers, he sees, are, are, are those who, who seek to win them to the truth, to win them uh, to the shepherd. And those are few. There are few laborers, and there are many people who need to hear the gospel. That is the gist. Many need salvation, but so few are laboring to win them to it. And this lack of people spreading the news about Jesus is also a reason for his compassion. There was many years ago this crisis in Romania where there was an overflow of orphans in the orphanages and very few people to help out. And these poor children, helpless they can't do anything for themselves. 
were not even getting some of their basic needs met, not even getting physical touch, not even getting food some days or drink. And the implications of that lasted their whole lives. They had no help and their whole lives were affected by it. And how can we think of such a thing, of such uh, great need and so few laborers and not be stirred up with compassion on those children? Many more are more uh, concerned about animals that are without homes than they are sinners without a Savior. We watch those commercials of the puppies that are stuck in these little cages and a little tear comes from our eyes. And then we look at the football stadiums and we see all these people that are just idolizing a sport or they're, they're just wandering, they're careless and we don't even care about them. We completely overlook their needs and we're just, oh, that poor puppy. If only it had a home and got pets and treats and, and food from the dinner table. And so the compassion of Jesus was stirred up because he saw these people were as sheep without a shepherd and there were few people that were actually proclaiming the gospel to them. And this reality is true in Denver and it's true in North Korea. Wherever you might be, you will find that there are more people in need of salvation than there are people willing to to win them to it. And especially in the case of, of global missions, in the most dangerous regions of the earth, the most secluded areas, we see the exact same thing, that there's a lack of laborers and there are many people that need to hear. We cannot be compassionate and yet also be content with the lack of laborers in this field. God's method of saving, as we went through in Romans 10, it's through faith. If you recall anything from Romans 10, the first thing that somebody needs to believe is somebody sent to them who's going to proclaim the gospel to them so that they might hear it and believe it. And therefore, since it's a requirement that people would be sent into the field, Jesus commands his disciples to pray to God to send out laborers into that field. And so our third point is that Jesus' compassion is stirred up and it's revealed in what he commands. Verse 38, read with me. I'll read from verse 37 to get the full context. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. This command to pray is yet again another overflow of his compassion upon the crowd. When one has compassion and they have the means to help the people in need, then true compassion will provide the most effective way to help that person. And so if a man is drowning and you're on a ship, you're floating, you're fine, you're going to look around on that ship to throw him something that floats, something that can help him. And there's lots of things that float. A piece of bread would float, a toothpick would float, a little scrap of wood would float, but if you throw anything like that to the person, it's not the most effective way to help him. When there's an inner tube, and you throw it to him on the other hand, you're able to help him. It's the most effective way to help him. He can grab onto it, and he can survive. And so Jesus' compassion compels him to give the most effective and powerful way to help these sheep without a shepherd. He sees their need and he addresses it by giving this command. Instead of Jesus commanding harder and longer laboring, he instead commands more fervent praying. We can often be discouraged by the great amount of unbelievers and the small amount of laborers. And in our minds and to our own wisdom, the most practical thing to do would be to to work harder, to labor longer, to become more exhausted. But if this was the most effective means of reaching the lost, then Jesus' compassion would have stirred him up to say so. But we read that he he commands us to pray instead. The solution is not to labor more earnestly, but to pray more earnestly. J.C. Ryle says, personal working for souls is good. Giving money is good, but praying is best of all. By prayer we reach God, without whom work and money are alike in vain. By prayer we obtain the aid of the Holy Ghost, 
Money can pay agents. Universities can give learning. Bishops may ordain. Congregations may elect. But the Holy Ghost alone can make ministers of the gospel and raise up workers in the spiritual harvest. Never, never may we forget that if we would do good to the world, our first duty, not our only duty, but our first duty is to pray. I'll say that again. Never may we forget that if we were to do good to the world, our first duty is to pray. You and me cannot send out a single person with all the money, all the resources, but God can, and so He calls us to pray. It's the same logic you have with many jobs. When there's too much work to get done and there's not enough workers, the most practical thing to do is to step back and to call your boss and say, hey, we need help. We need more laborers. So the logic is simple. The more laborers, the more work that gets done. The ratio becomes more equal. So Jesus is calling us, in a sense, to take that step back, to call on our God, to raise up more help. And the weight of this command is placed upon our favorite word here at Southside, therefore. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, because this very reason that the harvest is plentiful, for the very reason that there is a lack of laborers in the field, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. He does not want us just to pray uh, half-heartedly, but earnestly and sincerely. Not meaningless and careless prayers, but earnest prayers. Or as the, the NASB would render it, beseech the Lord of the harvest. Beg Him. Cry out to Him. Plead with Him. God, please. You might ask where this sort of prayer comes from. And the answer is, is that the, the thing that produces this prayer is the same thing that produced Jesus to give the command in the first place. is seeing the need of the lost. That is, we pray this prayer out of compassion for the lost. My friends, how much this morning do you care about the lost? In this self-focused season of Christmas when it's all about me, how much do you care about the lost? Those that don't have Jesus as their shepherd. How much do you care about those poor tribes and populations that are on the other end of the world who've never heard this message what about those who live in the same city as you? Work at the same job as you? Do you have compassion on them? Then you will also have these prayers. So to learn to pray like this, we need to learn compassion. Compassion is our teacher in prayer. Compassion comes from seeing the need of the world. You can't look upon uh, people with compassion until you look upon them as people that need something. They lack something. And some of you lack this compassion because you're unaware of the need. You're ignorant of the lack of laborers, ignorant of the realities of hell, ignorant of the lostness of the world. And so Jesus' is compassion, it comes in the context of seeing the multitudes of the people. But what do you see, my friends? What do you see when you see the crowds of people? What do you see when you see the thousands of people in the stands when you go watch the games after church today? What do you see at the restaurants when you fellowship? What do you see when you go shop at the mall this season? What do you see in the, the LGBTQ movement? Don't you see that these are many people that are like sheep without a shepherd, harassed, helpless, wandering, not knowing where they're going in the jaws of the lion? Do you care? See that these are, are people that are without Jesus. They're therefore without hope. They're without life. They're without freedom. They're without redemption. They're without reconciliation to God. They're without righteousness. They're without security. They lack everything. Though they have everything, if they have yachts and mansions and cars, if they don't have Christ, they lack everything. The poor and the rich alike, if they have no shepherd, they lack everything. To learn compassion, then consider the broad path leading to destruction. We might not like to think very much about this doctrine called hell. 
And we like to call it H-E double hockey sticks instead. But this is a, a reality that the more we let it sink in, the more compassion grows outward in our prayers and in our actions and in our, in our mercy toward people. And when you're mindful of the crowd on the broad path, consider that there's more than you alone are able to handle. There are more people perishing than there are people willing to give them the gospel. Discontent with the amount of labors in the field will produce this sort of prayer. And so often we, we leave those doors and we look to our right, we see that map of the world and, and we might say, wow, we've, we, we have a f- four or five people out there in the world. Let's not be content with that. Let us be stirred up. Oh God, send more labors into this field. Oh God, there are so many people who've never even heard of Jesus, even in our own city, even on our own campuses. God, raise up people. God, there is not enough. Oh, please, send laborers into your field. Raise up men and women, young and old, male and female, families and no families. Old couples, young couples. This sincere prayer comes from seeing that this harvest is coming to a close. Paul reminds Timothy, I charge you in the presence of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. Well, what's Paul going to charge Timothy? He says, preach the word in season and out of season. And in every harvest, we see that the winter is coming. And when the winter comes, the harvest ends. The plants die. There's no more need for gathering. And so there will come a time when Christ will come and the chance to reach the lost will be done. And as the winter approaches and there's more work to do, there becomes a greater urgency to to ask God for Him to raise up more help. The closer you see the end, the more fervent you make these prayers. My friends, the winter storm is approaching. And in Denver, we get to see when the snow is coming in the west, We have a few more hours to do what needs to get done. So we know that Christ is coming soon. Perhaps this very hour, this very week, before the year ends, let our prayers be made all the more earnestly. God, raise up men and women for this. Raise up. Send people. Sincere prayer comes when you see that your prayers are truly effective. Jesus commands us to pray this with the confidence that God truly hears it and answers it. He commands us to pray it because it's the means that God has ordained to send laborers into his field. He's not asking us to do something that's useless and ineffective. The Lord of the harvest sends laborers into his field upon the chariots of our prayers. God hears and he answers these prayers. And if we truly desire to be a church that's mission-minded and we have these conferences on missions and we, we, we study it, then we must be a praying church knowing that God truly does answer these prayers. Not just occasionally, but frequently and corporately together, let us join our hearts regularly to the Lord of the harvest, taking the first steps commanded to us by the Lord by praying for workers. In our community groups, at home, and in fellowship, let us pray for this. Let this also be a strong encouragement to us with many weaknesses. You might be timid in sharing the gospel. I know I am. But there's no reason to be timid to pray to the Lord of the harvest. You might be bound to your own bed listening to the sermon online asking, God, what purpose do I have in the kingdom? Why, why am I even still alive? How am I able to contribute to the Great Commission? And my friends, here's your contribution. This is your contribution. It does not take a scholar to pray, but it takes this childlike faith, believing that God answers it. Often we're afraid of sharing the gospel. Think we might not know how. We might not know how to answer the questions that people ask in response. But my friends, you do know how to pray. You do know how to to ask God the simple request. So don't overlook this, that the greatest contribution 
to the Great Commission and to all sorts of ministries and evangelism, it is prayer. And the most fitting response to the shorthanded work crew is prayer. William Carey, a missionary to India who translated the Bible to, to many different languages, proclaiming the gospel to many people, having a very faithful and fruitful ministry. When he was asked where all of his success came from, he, he was mentioned that his sister, who's been bedridden, has been praying earnestly for him, nonstop. And to that, he contributed all the weight of the success. When you look behind the scenes of every fruitful ministry, there are unnamed, unknown Christians who've been praying faithfully that you would never have known about. How beautiful are the feet that bring the good news indeed, and how beautiful also are the knees that bow before the Father, creator of the ends of the earth, and ask Him for more laborers. Therefore, if you feel like you play such a small role in the kingdom of heaven, then by simply praying, you suddenly play one of the biggest roles, the most important roles, the most needed roles. And so parents, see your Christian children and teach them how to pray for the nations, how to pray for the gospel to go out, not only in word, but also by example. See also that Christ is worthy to pray such prayers for your children, that God would specifically raise them up and set them apart to give their lives to this cause, to that commission that Christ has given us, to, to share the wonderful news that a shepherd has come for the shepherdless sheep. Earnestly, sincerely, with pleading and begging, ask God to raise them up, to raise them up, to be laborers in this field. And pray such prayers for your church, for our youth group, for the third and fourth graders, for the first and second graders, for the young families and young marrieds. Pray this prayer for your church. For the Nike Fellowship Group. For old and young alike. As a church, we have longed to see revival take place in our land. And we, we must not think that it's just magically going to appear before us without these prayers. Revival takes place under the circumstances of mighty and extraordinary prayers, said Jonathan Edwards. But it's not to end simply with prayer. Write this in your notebooks. Chapter 9 is followed by chapter 10. All right? Where Jesus sends his disciples to proclaim the truth. This story is in connection with what Jesus just said in these few verses. This call to pray is not a call to close our lips to proclaim the truth of Jesus. And we can't use this verse as an excuse to completely take ourselves away from ministering to unbelievers. Imagine if Paul and Silas, when they heard the Philippian jailer come to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, let me pray that God would send you a laborer. Oh God, send this man a laborer that he might hear the gospel and believe it. It's a ridiculous thing. Paul instead, he proclaims the gospel to him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and your household, and you will be saved. Some of you might be praying for laborers when suddenly you find yourselves in the very circumstances of being in the midst of the field. Jesus sends his disciples, chapter 10, verse 1, to heal every disease and affliction. Find, the, find these connections. And in chapter 10, verse 7, to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in chapter 10, verse 6, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now, we are the instruments of God's compassion to the lost. What Jesus did with great compassion toward the people, He now gives us to do. He now sends us in His compassion to the world. His compassion is now being demonstrated through us as we go to the lost sheep. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. The love that Christ has for us and the love that Christ has for the world, it controls us, it compels us to to love and have compassion on the people because He does. Chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. We are now instruments of God's compassion in our prayers and in our labors. God making His appeal through us. Perhaps you walked here in the church today harassed and helpless as sheep without the Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ. And I implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Your need this morning is to come under His shepherding care. Your need is is to find Jesus Christ. You are helpless to gain eternal life in your own strength. You'll never find it. You'll never find the way on your own. And, And truth is near impossible to find in this world that's just full of lies. And so Jesus, in rich compassion, He comes and He says, I am the way. Stop trying to find it elsewhere. I am the way. And you're looking for life. And Jesus says, I am the life. And you're looking for the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus came to give all of your needs a fulfillment in Himself. So you can find the way and the truth and the life in Him and in Him alone. And so I beg you this morning to come to Jesus, to stop wandering, to stop being as these sheep without a shepherd, because Jesus is calling you to come to Him that He might be your shepherd. He cares for you to the utmost, to the highest degree. Not that He would just heal your body, but that He would die on a tree and bear the curse for you, to to die for your sins so that you don't have to be harassed and helpless any longer. He cares for you. And the cross is evidence of that. And through this death, He destroys the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and delivers those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So that if you come to Jesus today, harassed and helpless without a shepherd, then all those needs are are immediately solved. Being harassed no more, helpless no more, shepherdless no more. All found in this one person. You can't help yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't deliver yourself, but Jesus can deliver you. Amen? Amen. Let Let us pray together. Father, our compassionate Father, You see the billions of people on this planet, and we know that Your eye pities them. We know that You care for them. We know that Your desire is not that they would perish, but that they would be led to the knowledge of the truth, that they would repent and turn to You. God, in your rich compassion toward the world, I ask you, Lord, to raise up men and women, children and families, and and all sorts of people. Lord, to carry out this compassion to the world, to show them that there is a shepherd and they they have no need to wander anymore if only they would look and believe. Oh God, stir up Your people this morning. Stir up laborers to go into Your field. And stir up everybody here, Lord, to pray. To truly ask You, Lord, to to send laborers into Your field. We can't send people, God, if, if You're not in it. Unless You send laborers, Lord, in vain would we strive. So we beg You, God, that the world might praise Your name, that they would be reconciled to You. Send laborers to them, God, to Denver, 
to the college campuses, to Castle Rock, to the Springs, to Aurora, to all these places in Colorado. Send laborers, Lord, outside of our state, to other states, to other countries, to other continents, to places in the most strangest parts of the world, hot and cold climates, where people are wandering, helpless and harassed, in the jaws of the lion who need a shepherd who can sling his stones and slay the lion which is grasping them with its mouth. Oh, let there be an urgency, God, in our hearts to pray these prayers. Please. God, I beg you, don't let a single one of your children, don't let anybody here walk out of here this morning forgetting what they've heard. Stir us up, God. As we go back to our lives, to work, to the restaurants, to the football games, to all these places, God, show us the world. Show us the broad path. Take our focus off of ourselves. Let us see what you saw that day. Let us see that, that the people are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Please, God, Reveal that to us. Lord, don't let us forget this. Don't let us forget what a great need they have and what a perfect solution You are. Lord, You are truly precious, truly wonderful, truly amazing. The apple of our eye. The pearl of great price. You are everything to us, God. Oh, that You would be everything to those across the world as well. So we ask this, Lord, in Your name because only You can do this. Only You have the power and the ability to do this. Please, God, in Your holy name, Amen.